to the creative morning stage. Oh, good morning. I am so excited to be here, to be in person with all of you. I see a lot of people that I've known throughout the years, and so that is super exciting for me. Um, as she said, I'm a designer. Um, I've been designing for about 10 years, and I've been a part of the Phoenix design community for about eight or nine years. Um, so it's a super exciting um, space for me to be up here speaking with you guys because for a lot of the time I was behind the scenes doing the planning and and all of that so it's kind of coming full circle so it's really exciting for me so thank you all for coming and supporting creative mornings and creating um, a space for creative people to come together in community um, so I'm just really thankful for that um, I'm going to be talking about folklore today and the power of storytelling because as creatives, as business owners, as designers, as writers, as um, hairdressers, I don't know where she went, <laughs> there she is. We're, we're storytellers. We innately see something and, and create a story about it. Um, so really quick, I'm gonna log into my computer so I have my notes. <laughs> Can you hold up? I don't get it. Also, I want to put a plug out there. Since you guys are all here, I'm assuming you're community minded. You want to be around other creatives. So get involved. Creative mornings, they need volunteers. They need specifically a, a video editor. So if you would like to brush up your skills, if you're already doing it, talk to them. They need people for social media, people to help out, especially because they're going to be having a baby soon. Um, another really good way to get involved is AIGA. I was on the board for a long time. You're going to make friendships and connections with people that you're going to have forever, and you're going to really get to have a say in what happens in our community. As well. So, And they're always looking for people, so get on the board, okay? Okay. So 500 years ago in Mexico, Maria was a beautiful woman. She had long black hair and really she had everything that you could want in a, in a lady. She was single. And so one day she met her man to be and they got married, they fell in love. And like most romantic, good romantic stories, they had babies, they had two children. And life was good for Maria. She lived in a village. She loved her life. She was so excited every day that she woke up until one day she came home and she found her husband with another woman. Maria was filled with rage and just all out insanity. She was out of her mind. So she decided she needed to leave. She took her children and she went to the river. And by the river, she was still just seeing red, just rage, and she didn't know what she needed to do. And in her rage and in her insanity, she threw her children into the river. Immediately regretted it and realized that, that was not what she wanted. So she jumped in after her children. She swam and she couldn't find them. Where were they? She, in her grief of her losing her children, in her anger, of her husband cheating on her and losing her life, she decided she didn't want to live. So she drowned as well. But here's the thing, because her, what she did, her soul was not able to cross over to the afterlife. And so she haunted, especially near waters. Legend has it that you can hear her crying still. You can hear her saying, mis hijos, mis hijos. They say that the further away she sounds, the closer she is to you, and the danger that she is to you, and the further away she sounds, or the closer she sounds, the further away she is. Now this is a story that I was told as a little girl, not by my parents, but by friends, and they were told that story by their parents, and some of you may know the story, it's called La Llorona, meaning the crying woman, and it was used as a story 
to keep children in line kind of a little bit like Santa Claus, but in a really kind of scary way. It was a way to keep children away from water. So as I was researching this story, I found out that this story has been around since the 15th century. People have been telling this story for over 500 years. Crazy. And then I was, I was, I was research, researching more and more um, folklore and stories. It's, it's not, it's actually a pretty common story of a woman out of her mind murdering her children, <laughs> but being in grief, right? And, and then haunting the planet. And so that was kind of how I propelled me into what I'm going to talk about today. And what I'm going to talk about is folklore and this, the, the power of storytelling. So what, what is folklore? It's traditional customs, tales, sayings, dances, or, or art forms that are preserved among a people. It's also um, often unsupported notions, stories, and a saying that's widely cir circulated. And for me, what I connected to that was story and how important story is to a community, to a culture, to a people, to a family, to a person. So the power of storytelling. Storytelling can take what's in the head and put it into the heart. It connects people. It has the power to connect communities. Like I said, I learned that story from my friends and they learned it from their, from their, their family and their friends. Um, but most importantly, story gives meaning. It gives meaning to life, it gives meaning to objects, it gives meaning to people. And what I mean by that, I, in my research, there, in 2009, there were two journalists. One was named Rob Walker, and the other one was Josh LeBlanc. And they wanted to do an experiment to understand how powerful storytelling was. So the way that they did that is they went to eBay and they bought over 200 objects, like thrifted objects, like stuff that are like the garage sale rejects that you're gonna see at Goodwill. And they spent 50 cents to a dollar on each object. So they bought 200 objects. And what they did was they hired 200 authors and sent each author an individual photo of the object and the object itself, or maybe they didn't send the object, but a photo of it, and asked them to write a story of the object. And what ended up happening was they, with, with the story, they re-uploaded the objects to eBay with the story. And what ended up happening will blow your mind. There, so for an example, there was a little bird figurine, like a ceramic, worth nothing type of figurine. They bought it for 50 cents and they sold it for $52. All in all, with the 200 objects, they spent around $120 and they made $8,000 on these objects. Just by, by adding a story to them. And, the, and I read some of the stories and they were long stories. They were outlandish stories, um, but it gave character and it gave meaning to those objects and it made them valuable way beyond what they were worth. So I was 16 and we were in New York City. And I was there with my art class. And so we were going to the different museums and we went to a museum that changed my life. It's called the PS1 MoMA and it's a very modern art, like avant-garde installation art art that you can experience with your body and with your mind and with your heart and touch things. And so it's also, it's located in Queens and it's in an old school. So it's also got a lot of character um, and lots of like little nooks and crannies to, for artists to create stories and to do fun things with. So I walk in and there's like a ticketing table and there's some seats to wait or whatever. And we walk in and there's hardwood floors that are really old and have been around forever. And there's a hole in the floor. And I look down and there is literally a woman like acting like she's stuck in the floor. And it's like, I, I had to do a double take and I looked down and there literally was a screen. And this was like 2006. So this was before little screens. I have no idea where they got the screen. But it like kind of like ushered our brains into like 
thinking about art and what can be art and what can be a story. Because we all automatically you try to put a narrative is like, is that a, literally a tiny woman? <laughs> is this like a honey, I shrunk the kids moment? Or is it like, is there, is it like trying to create distance? So that's what you walk into. And then we're, we're roaming the, um, the rooms and looking around and there was another room that we walked into. And this room from far, it kind of looked like a Rubik's cube. And what I mean by that is there was a neon string from one wall to the other wall. And the strings went up every three feet and down and down and down. And then there were strings from floor to ceiling all the way down. And so what that meant was that you were literally seeing the square footage of the room and you had to experience the room differently because you had to like walk through the strings and you had to get through. And it was like, as a 16 year old person who didn't really understand what does square footage mean? What does a room mean? What does space mean? And it just boggled my mind. So I wandered around a little bit more and there happens to be an open, another open door and I walk in and it's a little room and there's shelves and like Clorox bleach and a trash can and different cleaning supplies. And I'm, I'm looking around and I realize I'm like, oh, this is like, this is a janitor's closet installation. Like they're trying to like say, a, you know, like what are they trying to say with this? And then I looked down and there was an empty Snickers wrapper. I was like, is this about consumerism? Like they're, they're polluting the earth and, or, or maybe the, the janitor was really busy and it slipped out of their pocket or and that didn't make it in the trash. And I walked out and realized it was literally just the janitor's closet. <laughs> But what that did for me was it made me realize that like life can be art and art can be life. And we can put like, literally we can put a story to anything. We, we naturally do that. So today I wanna to talk about three keys to storytelling and how we can be better storytellers. Because again, like I said, we are all innately a storyteller. We're born, that, we're born in a story, I'm sure. Every single one of your mothers or grandmothers have told the story of how you were born and remember the whole day. The other thing about storytelling is that it sticks with us. We remember stories, especially good stories. Um, the Harvard Business Review put a stat out that said, listen to this, especially if you're a marketer, stories stick with us 20 times longer than data. Stories stick with us 20 times longer than data. So the first key that I want to talk about is vulnerability. Storytelling and vulnerability connects the audience to the storyteller. So um, in 2020, I started a new job and I started it March 17th of 2020. The world shut down when I started. And um, it was for a consultancy, an agency, and I was the first designer at this consultancy. And so a lot of my work wasn't figured out. We had to figure it out as we went. And we were growing a lot in the pandemic. Agencies like did crazy amounts of work because everybody needed to like shift what they were doing and figure out a new strategy. Everything that they were doing wasn't working anymore. And so it was a grind. And the culture that was in that, the place that that consultancy was very, we're friends, bro -ish. And it was, it was hard, honestly, to be a woman and to be the only designer in that space where nobody understood where I was coming from as a creative person. And I began to have rumblings in my spirit and in my soul of like needing freedom and needing creative freedom. I didn't, I didn't want to feel like a prisoner at my desk anymore. And so um, I decided I wanted to do freelancing. And I made a whole brand for myself. I talked with people who were super successful in the game. I had big dreams. I wanted to have a podcast. I wanted to go and speak at conferences to get clients. Um, and I did really well in my first month. In my first month, I made $10,000. It was like, I can do this. I got this. 
especially when I was seeing what the consultancy was charging for the work that myself and my teammates were doing. I thought, I'm going to be a millionaire, guys. This is great. That was fun for me. And, and I actually had a goal, too. I wanted to save up $30,000 before I quit my job. And I was like, I, month one, I'm gonna, I'm, next month, I'm going to be quit my job. Well, that's not what happened. There was crickets. I had leads. I had people who said that they wanted to get work. They wanted to work with me. They wanted to do all these things. And like, literally nothing. Month two, month three, month four, month five. And I was like, at this point, super burned out my current job. I had had client, I don't know if any of you are in agency work, but like clients right now are like not nice. They are struggling at work. They are, they're having a tough time too. And it's easy to blame the agency. And so I was feeling like I was, I was the punching bag. And so I was burnt out and I was upset that my dream of a free mass and having my own business and hiring people and, you know, wasn't going to work. It wasn't happening. But then I had some friends who I had worked with at my previous, before my other job. And um, they were looking to hire another designer. And so because of that connection, because of our friendship, because of the stories we share, I actually got to get that job. And I'm currently working there. It's a mental health tech company. So like to go from agency crazy work to like, I'm literally designing like content pieces about how to be like how to be an advocate for people like how to deal with mental health how to deal with burnout it's just like crazy and so I say all of that to be vulnerable with you to tell you like I failed but I got was able to change my mind I was able to use my connections to like get myself out of the spot where I was but the point of that is that people want to hear real stories they want to hear vulnerability you, the story of like I made $10,000 and then the next month I made $30,000. Like nobody wants to hear that story. That's boring. Like boring. That, they don't make movies like that. The movies, you need, to, you need to feel the struggle. So, and in your stories, your values, your personality, you're being vulnerable. It creates empathy and you're creating a moment with people, which is like ultimately what we all want. We all want human connection. So be vulnerable. The second key is who are, who are you talking to? Um, have any of you ever heard of the brand Everlane? So it's a really cool brand. They sustainably source all of their material. You can track where things are coming from. They pay people a living wage to make their clothing. Um, and, and the clothing is also really nicely made. It's, it's really like, a, like staples. Um, and it kind of has that give back feeling. Like when you buy their clothing, you're like, my jeans weren't made by children. I feel great. This is awesome. But like, who do you think their audience is? When I'm asking, who do you think their audience is? Probably people who are like environmentalists, people who care about what's happening on the planet. But what's important about that is you need to know who you're talking to. What are their values? What do they need to hear? And how can you share your story to inspire them to, to sell something? Which brings me to my next point. Why are you telling the story? What do you want to achieve? What's the goal? Because all of that impacts how you tell your story and who you tell it to. And then how does that purpose change your narrative? So for example, my purpose in talking to you all today is to inspire and to have connection. So my point is, you're all storytellers. We all have it in us, whether it's in your personal life, and you, hey, my friend just got engaged, and then you go to like tell a story of your friend being engaged or you're excited um, about your new job and so you're telling your new job. Or in your professional life, how many of you have written an email? How many of you have been in a meeting? Those are all storytelling points. And so the key to being a good storyteller is to be vulnerable, to know your audience, and then to have a purpose. 
And one of the things that we can do right now in our life as we're experimenting with new things is kind of like have a bucket in the back of your brain to start storing your stories. Because your stories, again, are what connect you to other people. And the more ideas and the more stories that you have in the back of your head, whether it's yours or somebody else's, because when I was talking about who you're talking to, I told you my experience. But you could also tell somebody else's story. That's okay. That's just that's you're you're talking about somebody else's story. Um, so here's my challenge. I want you to think about when you go about your daily life. When can you build story? When can you use story to connect with somebody? Um, because stories, like I talked about getting a new job, have the potential to change your life, have the potential to change other people's lives. And ultimately to, con to connect you to your community, to connect you to people, and you, you might even be able to change the world, right? Like story has that power. So that's the end of my talk. Thanks for, for coming, and I think there's time for questions if anybody wants.